Episode 259 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you in part by Self-Publishing School. If you've ever thought about writing your own book, I recommend free training from Chandler Bolt. To sign up and get a free copy of Chandler's book, Published, visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash published. You want to have a group that just nurtures those crazy ideas that are the opposite of what you believe. They challenge your accepted wisdom. Maybe most of them will fail, and that's fine. Hi, and welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. It's the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth. I'm Jeff, and I believe that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then intentional and consistent reading is a must. Through the Read to Lead podcast, I'm going to help you not only narrow this important reading list, but bring you the key insights and main ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. One of those is a new author, and his brand new book is getting a lot of attention. His name is Safi Bacall, and his book, out as of today, is called Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. I'll ask Safi to share what a loon shot is and why it's important in business to understand the concept. We'll talk about the rules of loon shots so that you can better leverage these moments as they happen. I'll ask him about the importance of maintaining genuine curiosity, especially when others are criticizing or dismissing your ideas and theories, and plenty more. Before I bring Safi on, I want to make sure you know about the free online conference that I'm hosting starting April 30th and going through May 7th of this year, 2019. It's called the Boss Free Virtual Summit, and you can find out more about it at bossfreesummit.com. Now, this conference is for you if you've ever dreamed of being your own boss, starting your own business, doing your own thing, or would just like to explore some of those ideas. Again, it's free. There's no risk. You can sign up and get registered right now at bossfreesummit.com. You know, one of the keys to exploring this path is being able to do so with a bit of discretion. I've thought that through for you. You can attend the Boss Free Virtual Summit from anywhere and watch on any device. Even if you're not quite sure this is the path for you, the Boss Free Virtual Summit is a great step in the direction toward figuring that out. Registration is free and easy. Again, it's bossfreesummit.com. Safi Bacall received his BA summa cum laude in physics from Harvard and his PhD from Stanford, which is to say he's really smart. And I'm not intimidated in the slightest to talk to him. (laughs) After working for three years as a consultant for McKinsey, he co-founded a biotechnology company developing new drugs for cancer. He led that company's IPO and served as its CEO for 13 years. And in 2008, he was named E&Y New England Biotechnology Entrepreneur of the Year. And in 2011, he worked with President Obama's Council of Science Advisors on the future of national research. His brand new book and one I have truly loved, I found it, and the word I like to use is fascinating. It's called Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. Safi, it is a pleasure to welcome you to Read to Lead. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Jeff. Delighted to be here. Well, when I first became aware of the book, and I want to thank our mutual friend, uh, Dory Clark, for introducing us, I thought to myself, what is a, what is a loon shot? Why, why don't I know that term? Why don't I know what that means? So imagine my delight when I opened the book to discover that's a term that, that Safi invented. Uh, so Safi, uh, for context, uh, describe for us what you mean by this term and, and what you hope to accomplish by writing this book. Sure. Uh, well, everybody knows what a moonshot is. It's a big goal, something that a lot of people get behind, whether it's, you know, curing cancer or um, eliminating poverty, but it's a destination. How do you get there? And it turns out if you look back at the ideas that really changed science, business, or history, things that transformed industries, those ideas at the time were rarely announced with blaring trumpets and red carpets. They were often neglected and mm-hmm. their champions were written off as crazy. And not just for you know a month or a week or even a year, sometimes for decades. And so that's what I thought was fascinating. Those ideas, those are what I call loon shots, the neglected ideas where everyone writes them off as crazy. So a moonshot is a destination. A loon shot is how we get there. For example, when Kennedy declared the goal of putting a man on the moon in 1961, that was a classic 
moonshot. He was widely applauded. But what few people realize is that 40 years earlier, Robert Goddard developed the idea of how we would get there, which is jet propulsion, mm. in other words, rockets. And when he developed that idea in the 20s, he was written off as completely nuts. I mean, the New York Times published an editorial saying that this so-called physicist has this idea and he doesn't understand the basic laws of science that we teach every day in high school, namely the action and reaction. Newton's laws tell you that, you know, rockets will never fly in space. And so he was sort of ridiculed and the U.S. kind of dismissed it, which was actually very dangerous because German scientists did not. And in fact, Germans developed missiles and jet engines and jet planes during World War II before the Allies. So missing loon shots is, can be very dangerous. And of course, 49 years after the Times published that first piece making fun of Robert Goddard was the day after, in 1969, the day after the launch of the Apollo 11 rocket to the moon, the successful launch to the moon, the Times issued a retraction. Rockets do not, in fact, violate the laws of physics, and the Times regrets the error. <laughs> I love that. Uh, when, I, when I read that, I, I, I literally laughed out loud. We regret that error. Um, I want to explore with you, uh, Safi, the, the rules of, of loon shots. What can we do to foster these or, or help, help move them along? Talk about the first rule, the process of, of separating the phases, as you call it, and how this can apply to, to human groups. Sure. Well, underlying the stories in the book is a new way of thinking about the behavior of groups and peeling back the structure. What happens when you bring people together into a group when you have a mission and a reward system tied to that mission is that you create two competing incentives. And you can think of those incentives as aspects of structure rather than culture. So most management books, and when I was first, you know, first became a CEO, I was, I think, 33 or so. I read every book I could find on how to build a great company, how to empower your teams, how to do great strategy. And most of those things focused on culture. So this book and this idea and the two phases that you talk about is something else. It's about structure. What happens when you organize either a team or a company or any kind of group with a mission and a reward system tied to that mission? And you create, when you do that, two competing incentives for people. One of them is their stake in their outcome, the outcome of their project or the outcome of their whatever they're working on towards your mission. Let's say you have a biotech company, which is what I was doing. I was developing cancer drugs in a, in a small biotech company. It's the stake in the outcome of the project or the product. The second force incentive is the perks of rank. They want to get promoted. They want to have a higher salary and more prestige. Those two things are not always aligned. And whenever you have two competing forces, you create kind of a tug of war. So underlying the stories in the book is, is a model which creates an analogy or a map to what you might think of as even just as a, in, in a glass of water. Individual molecules in a glass of water also have two competing forces. They want to run around and be free. That's sort of entropy. And they want to lock rigidly into place. That's binding energy. So whenever you have those two competing forces, you get in science what you call a phase transition, a sudden shift in a system. Mm. So in a glass of water, that's what happens when you cross 32 Fahrenheit. The relative balance between those forces shifts and you go from being fluid, you can stick your finger in a glass of water and slush it around, to being completely rigid. And so that's what happens in teams and companies as well. Mm. You have these two phases. It's sort of the equivalent of a, a fluid slushing around, embracing wild new ideas phase because you're in, everybody's incentive is aligned around the crazy new idea, whether you have a buy small biotech company, you're developing a new cancer drug, or you're at a small film production shop or some kind of startup with a new product. Everybody embraces a crazy new idea and you... Just like that fluid glass of water, you slush, everybody is fluid and flexible and how do we best achieve this goal? And then as you adjust certain parameters of organizational design, of organizational structure, sort of the equivalent of temperature, all of a sudden the company behavior will suddenly change. And it has nothing to do with culture. The company behavior, will, the behavior of those groups of people will suddenly change. And it has to do with structure, with their incentives. Mm -hmm. Once you cross a certain size, people are more incentivized to climb up the corporate ladder. There's a greater reward from them to get promoted. They might get, you know, if you're at a large company, you might get a 30 or 40 percent bump in salary if you climb up the corporate ladder. And if you're at a large company, your stake, you know, in your particular project, let's say you work at Pfizer and you're working on a little drug, you know, if your drug makes a few hundred million in sales, that's awesome. It sounds awesome, but Pfizer has 50 billion in sales. So your stake in the outcome is not as big, but the force, the perks of rank are enormous. So what happens is when you're at large companies, you're in one phase. 
that more rigid phase. When you're in small companies, you're in the other phase, the more fluid phase. And you can work out the underlying mathematics of that and show how that happens. And between those two is a sudden change where companies going from embracing wild, crazy new ideas to rigidly rejecting them. I think what's different about this book and you know what was kind of fun for me, having been a consumer of lots of culture books and management books and leadership books, is I, I was looking for something harder core as a scientist, something that wasn't just sort of fluffy psychology mm. stuff, but had a real hardcore where you could really understand underlying science and underlying mathematics of it. So what it tells you, to come back to your two phases question, is whenever you organize people into a group, they can organize into one phase or the other, solid or liquid. You can't be in two phases at the same time. It doesn't make sense. Water can't be solid and liquid at the same time. It's either ice or it's water can't be both. Mm. And so that's the point of the two phases. You can either have a company like a small biotech that's embracing wild new ideas, or you can be in the phase where the incentives favor career promotion. So you can't be in two phases at the same time, with one exception, right at the cusp of a phase transition, right at 32 Fahrenheit. If you bring a bathtub, for example, to 32 Fahrenheit, what you will see is life at the edge of a phase transition, life at 32 Fahrenheit. That's the one place the two phases can coexist. And what happens to in a bathtub when you bring into 32 Fahrenheit is that the solid phase separates, you get blocks of ice, and the liquid phase separates, you get pools of liquid, and they coexist. Neither side dominates. They're living in balance. And so that's what I mean by separating the phases. So the, the stories, the companies or the groups or the organizations that have succeeded are essentially bringing their organization to 32 Fahrenheit. They create one group that's focused on operational excellence and execution and one group that's focused on embracing wild new ideas. And the leaders or the managers, rather than you know diving into the weeds in one group, you know, hey, what's your new idea? Let's do this one. Or diving into the operational excellence, here's how you want to hit your sales targets and, or build your machine. They focus on getting the balance between those two groups correctly. They separate the two groups. That's the phase separation, one solid, one liquid. And they create a balance between the two groups. They make sure that neither side overwhelms the other. And so that's what I mean by the separation of phases. And what you're describing there, if I understand correctly, is, is what you then get into in, in rule number two, which is creating dynamic equilibrium, right? Exactly. So if you bring a bathtub to... Th this may sound a little weird to professional, <laughs> you know, uh, managers or CEOs. You know, having been a public, I was a public company CEO for seven years. And believe me, if I went to one of my portfolio, you know, I have a lot of investors and public shareholders. And if I on an earnings call, so let me tell you about how our company is like a bathtub. <laughs> and my job is to bring this bathtub to 32 Fahrenheit. You know, my board of directors would have gotten some calls. What is wrong with Safi? <laughs> is it time to talk succession plan? Mm. So that's, you know, that's more for the internal discussions you know, with your team. It's, it's, it's a helpful guide. I'll, I'll talk about the bathtub for one minute, then I'll bring it back to the real world of <laughs> CEOs and executive team meetings. When you have life at 32 fair, when you, when you have uh, life at the edge of a phase transition, you have your artists in one group, your creative scientists, or your, your, your wildly creative types in one, one side, and the, the soldiers who are executing your sales and marketing staff, your operation, or your assembly. That phase separation does often happen in companies. Companies do often build innovation labs, for example, where that's the idea. It almost always fails. Why does it fail? because they miss this second rule, the idea of dynamic equilibrium. Mm. So in real life, when you have phase separation and you have blocks of ice and pools of liquid, it's not static. Molecules in the pools of liquid are swimming around and then they encounter a block of ice and they lock and they freeze. Molecules on the block of ice start jiggling and then they swim off the side and then join the pool. It's a constant cycle back and forth between the two. And that's what good managers or leaders do. And that's why most innovation labs fail. Not because they haven't come up with good ideas. It's because of the lack of transfer between mm. the two sides. So I, I can give you an example. The first uh, story is about World War II and how Vannevar Bush helped turn the course of, of the war and helped the Allies win. And so what, what he did, and he was a famous engineer and inventor and scientist, dean of engineering at MIT, and he, had, he also knew business quite well. He had started a company which eventually became Raytheon, but he also understood the military. He'd been working with the Navy for many years. And in 1939, he understood, like a, a number of people, not many, that the odds did not look good for the Allies. 
in early 1939, although we're obviously looking with hindsight, it mm. seems inevitable that we won. But in early 1939, the odds did not look good. The Germans had developed this new technology, the U-boats, that looked ready to strangle the Atlantic and cut off Europe from uh, America, which they did. They did that for the first three and a half years of the war, and the, the Allies had no answer. The German planes, the Luftwaffe, looked like they were ready to bomb Europe into submission. They had, the Allies had no answer, and that's exactly what happened. Within weeks, bombed Europe into submission, except for England. And then in early 1939, the two German scientists discovered something called nuclear fission, splitting the atom, which put Hitler within reach of the most dangerous weapon ever invented by mankind. So Vannevar Bush quit his job. He was offered, to, if he would stay, that, to, to, that they would make him president of MIT. But he said, you know, this is too big of a national risk. He quit his job, moved to Washington, talked his way into a meeting with FDR and said, it was a 10-minute meeting, but it probably changed the course of the war more than any, any other such meeting. And he said, there's a war coming which FDR understood. And he said, we're going to lose because it's going to be a technology driven war and the military will never catch up in time. And if you are a CEO, you know this feeling. You have this great franchise, but you see your competitors coming up with this crazy new technologies. And how do you move your organization to compete mm -hmm. with all these, all your tiny competitors are coming up with these really good technologies. And that's what Vannevar Bush saw. And the answer today about, you know, a lot of management books is, oh, you know, just tell everybody to innovate. And that's wrong. That's a problem. But Bush understood that back then. And he said, it's not that military leaders individually don't want to innovate. It's not that they're bad people. Everybody individually loves innovation. Mm. Everybody, all of those military leaders want the next gun or gadget. But when you organize them into a group, you get this, what's in science called this emergent behavior, this phase, mm. where as a group, you end up rejecting new ideas, even if individually you all love them. He understood that. So he said, you know what? Nothing to do with culture. Forget culture. All the, these military guys are great. And he was friends with them. And he, he was able to influence more war more than others because he had a lot of respect for the military, unlike other scientists. And he said, I'm not going to try to change culture. They have the right culture for what they need to do. They do, in fact, need to move millions of soldiers in four continents. They do need to build millions of guns and ships and planes and get them to people they I need to create a separate structure. So he did the phase separation. He created a group of crazy scientists working on crazy ideas. They developed the technologies that really turned the course of the war, the microwave radar that identified the U-boats and helped free up the, win the Battle of the Atlantic and, and so on. But the key was rule number two, which you got to, dynamic equilibrium. Within a year or two, Bush realized the problem wasn't coming up with these new ideas. The problem was the, the dynamic exchange of those ideas between the two groups. For example, the scientists, the, the he created a quarantine group at MIT, and that was a group that ended up developing microwave radar. That was a technology that allowed uh, pilots to see U-boats anywhere in the water and then just shoot them down like fish in a barrel. <laughs> when the scientists at MIT finally developed that, that they were, you know, partying. This is fantastic. We did a test. We can see a U-boat, Boston Harbor. This is awesome. Let's just give it to the pods. And so they launched it off and nothing happened. They launched it off the pod for almost a year. Nothing happens. The pilots wouldn't use it. So Bush got on the job. He said, look, why aren't pilots using it? And he had the scientists go in the cockpit, in the planes with the pilots to see what was going on. And what they realized is that the pilots... They liked the new technology, but in the heat of battle, the technology, the box that they had, you know, had these like 14 switches. They just didn't have time while they were being shot at to figure out which switch did what. <laughs> they realized it wasn't a problem with their technology. The technology worked. The user interface sucked mm -hmm. in the heat of battle. Obviously, when they were sitting in a, uh, you know, in a building in Boston, they didn't have people firing at them every five seconds. <laughs> Once they saw that, they went back into the lab. And they came out with that, you know, display with that, you know, little green display with a line that swiggles around that you see in movies and all the little dots. That's called a PPI display. They gave that, gave it back to the pilots. Pilots started using it. And within six weeks, the U-boats were finished. And the, the war had really uh, crossed a turning point. Mm. So the lesson there is that it wasn't just, they, the scientists had invented the technology and the technology was great. It wasn't just getting the pilots to use it, which was hard enough. That's one direction, getting it out of the lab and into the field. But the opposite direction, which people often miss, is equally important. Getting the feedback from the soldiers in the field back to the scientist in the lab, because nothing ever works perfectly the first time. So to come back mm. to the business world, if you've got a product and you have your these super creative engineers have come up with these super creative ideas and they're all excited and high-fiving themselves and they give it to the sales and marketing team. 
Well, the sales and marketing team goes out, they test it, a customer uses it, 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 something doesn't work right. And then the customer just says, yeah, whatever. That happens with every product, every product launch first version. So that could be the end of it. If you don't get the feedback effectively and quickly back to the creatives in the lab, you're done. So if Bush hadn't stepped in and forced these radar scientists to get in a plane and see firsthand what was going on, they never would have identified the problem and solved the problem. So you asked about rule number two, dynamic equilibrium. It's the cycle back and forth between those two that's critical. Mm. And this, in many ways, changes how we should think about the job of a leader. So there's this sort of mm. image that the leader is this great holy guru that stands on top of a mountain, a Moses with his staff that says, this is the next crazy idea, you know, the Steve Jobs, mm. we will do the iPod thing. And that's, that's actually not what really happened, not even with in the case of Steve Jobs, it's sort of a myth. It's sort of the, what you read about in the, in the newspapers, the headlines. But that's not what really happens. The truly great leaders, the ones like Vannevar Bush, actually stay out of the ideas. Mm. Rather than being a Moses on the top of the mountain, they're more like gardeners. Their job is to manage the touch and balance between these two sides, between the artists and the soldiers. Because those two groups don't speak the same language. They don't have the same incentives. Mm. And that's why the transfer usually fails. And so... Most innovation fails not because of the lack of new idea. Most innovation fails because of the transfer. So the job of a great leader is to manage the transfer, not the technology. Steve Jobs was, was great at bringing these groups together, but he kind of had to learn the hard way, didn't he, that you can't disparage <laughs> the one that you don't most identify with. He had to kind of, uh, I think he learned from, from Ed Catmull a bit from Pixar uh, in that regard, how, how to love these two groups equally. Yeah, so the key to managing that is you have to love your artists and soldiers equally. And the problem that most leaders have, and especially technology types, you know, Silicon Valley or anywhere really, who grew up with a love of technology, and that was the case of Steve Jobs when he first started out in his first time at Apple and even through his next two companies at Next and at, when he first acquired Pixar, he saw himself as a great product person a technology person. And product, product, product is what it's all about. The creatives working on new products, those were the heroes. So in fact, when he first started Apple at his first time there with Steve Wozniak, the Apple II became a success for a little while. And then it was rapidly surpassed by IBM and, and Tandy and eventually Commodore. And it started struggling a bit. You know, Jobs was asked to work on some other projects. So he worked on that, tried to work on the Apple II, Apple III franchise, and that didn't go very well. The Lisa project, and that didn't go very well. And finally, there was a small side project called the Macintosh that another guy had developed, a guy named Jeff Raskin. And so he took that over, shoved that Raskin, took it over. And he started saying, well, all you people who are working on the franchise and the soldiers who are building, you know, doing the, the manufacturing and the building and the improving to the Apple III, you guys are all, you guys all suck. You know, you're all bozos and you know, you're regular Navy and me and my band of artists are the awesome because we're building something new. So that was a disaster. So the Macintosh launch was a, a flop, although it had a great, one of the all time great ad campaigns, the 1984 Super Bowl ad. But after that kind of publicity wore off, the Macintosh had a ton of problems mm. and, you know, it would overheat and it was too slow and it just couldn't compete. And so sales completely dropped off and the company, because Jobs had so antagonized, he loved the artist and ridiculed the soldiers, a lot of the great soldiers left, including Steve Wozniak, mm. who was working on Apple III, but not only that, many people, and then eventually on his own team, because when you create that kind of dysfunction and hatred between the two groups, it's not a, it's not a good place to work. <laughs> and so people were fleeing. And, you know, for good reason, the board of directors stepped in and said, look, this is a problem. It's not sustainable. In fact, the company was in very dangerous uh, situation. It was heading for bankruptcy. So he exited and then he started his next company, actually called Next, <laughs> to build this, you know, another big product because he was this big technology guy. And that flopped. And then he bought the Pixar, what was the Lucasfilm computer division, because they had, he was excited about the big computer and he thought he would use that to compete against Apple. And that flopped. And uh, there was a small side project going on at, at the Pixar, at this, uh, uh, the computer was called the Pixar Imaging Computer, the PIC. There was a small side project, a couple of people in the, you know, sort of 100 person company were working on trying to make animated movies. And he tried to shut that down a few times, but eventually saw, hey, these guys are, their stuff is pretty good. People are liking it. So he kept that going. And he, realized through that, and especially through the film business, once he started getting more involved through Catmull and, and Pixar, is that they have learned that you need both. You need the artists mm -hmm. and the soldiers. 
you can't make a good movie with just artists and you can't make a good movie with just soldiers and you can't make a good movie if they don't cooperate. You need the people with the really wild creative ideas, but you need the production staff, the team, the operational excellence, the on budget, the timing, the logistics of the shoot, both have to come together. So in the film business, just like in my area, which was in biotech, the artists and the soldiers are forced to work together. Otherwise, you, you fail fast. You're, you're done. In biotech, you need the biologists and the scientists and the, and the chemists and the crazy scientists to work together with the regulatory people and the marketing people. And neither side can dominate too much because if they do, the whole thing falls apart. So you, you're forced to. You don't really have any choice. And those are kind of outlier industries because they, you know, they have these products that take a 10 year timeline and cost a billion dollars uh, to do or, you know, a hundred million dollars in the case of film, a billion dollars in the case of drug discovery. So, yeah, so jobs learn through kind of exposure to the film industry that you've got to love your artists and soldiers equally. You can't say, oh, I'm an artist and everybody else is a bozo. <laughs> so 12, which is what he did in the beginning. So 12 years after he first left Apple, he returned when Apple, you know, Apple had a little bit of a renaissance, and then again, it was going back down the toilet. They hadn't been able to compete or upgrade against the PC clones. Uh, and so they eventually acquired Next for the software. He realized, like, well, actually, the software is pretty good. And then he stepped in, and when he stepped back into Apple, he had learned to love his artists and his soldiers equally. You know, his artist was, let's say, the, the example is the, the Johnny Eve who is the designer behind many of the great Apple products. And the soldier, well, Tim Cook, who is currently the CEO, was called the Attila the Hun of inventory <laughs> when he was a compact before he was recruited to Apple. And so Jobs didn't say you're better or worse. You know, this guy who's the, this awesome, brilliant designer is better or worse than this guy who's the Attila the Hun of inventory. You're equal. And I love both of you equally. And in fact, his successor was Tim Cook, the soldier, not mm. Johnny Eve, the, mm. the creative. So yes, that's about learning to love your artists and soldiers equally. It's a very common trap that you see all the time that people say one is better than the other. Many product technology innovator types miss that. Jobs had the good fortune to be wealthy from his first time <laughs> at Apple. So he survived you know, 10 years in the wilderness and all the mm. kind of mistakes and problems and had a second chance. Uh, many people don't get that second chance. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Safi's book is getting a ton of positive attention. Uh, Washington Post includes it among the 10 leadership books to watch for this year. Inc. includes it in its list of 10 books you need to read this year. Business Insider includes it in its list of 14 books everyone will be reading this year. Adam Grant includes it on his list of new leadership books to look for. And Bob Sutton includes it on his list of books that every leader should read. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, you know, the winner of the Nobel Prize and the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, says this book has everything, new ideas, bold insights, entertaining history, and convincing analysis not to be missed by anyone who wants to understand how ideas change the world. Wow. Think about that for a minute. How would you like to write a book and have people responding to it in that way? Well, the fact is, writing a book is really, really hard. And, and writing a book that actually gets that kind of attention and prompts real people to read it, not just your, your friends and your family, that can feel oftentimes nearly impossible. That's if you don't have a proven system in place that you can follow. And that's one of the reasons why I'm super excited about what they're doing at self publishing school. My friend Chandler Bolt is the founder. It's an online education company dedicated to helping people like you get your book idea out of your head and onto paper as fast as possible, and then getting your published book into the hands of as many readers as possible. Now, he's hosting, Chandler is, free training on this process where he'll show you the exact steps to follow to go from blank page to published author in as little as 90 days and the exact book launch blueprint to follow to launch your book to, to $10,000 plus and beyond earning monthly royalties, by the way, month after month. Now, I cannot recommend this training highly enough. If you've ever thought of writing a book, you owe it to yourself to sign up for it. And it's completely free. You can register right now at readtoleadpodcast.com slash published. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash published. And that's not all. When you sign up for the training, Chandler sends you a free copy of his best-selling book, 
published, a book that's been featured here on the Read to Lead podcast in the past. So even if you don't end up attending the training, why would you not sign up for it? You get a free book about publishing your own book when you do. Visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash published. Well, when these crazy ideas or loon shots are are one's own, Safi, uh, speak to the importance of of maintaining genuine curiosity, especially when others are criticizing or dismissing your ideas and and theories. Sure. I kind of discovered that personally. So when I I was a young entrepreneur, you know, most of my friends were also kind of young entrepreneurs. And you're pursuing some big idea and you're putting your life, your soul, your energy, your ambition is going into this project, this idea, this technology, and you're doing everything you can to make it succeed. And so when you show it to, let's say, an investor, and the investor says, yeah, I, I don't think so. You know, it's, you know, there are these problems. Or when you have, let's say, a strategic partner lined up and the partner walks away or a customer says, yeah, this kind of sucks. That's a very hard message to hear. And often people tend to react. The natural inclination is to react by dismissing. Well, this investor didn't get it. This partner didn't get it. Mm-hmm. Let's just keep at it. And the problem with that is that you don't improve. That's not the way you ultimately succeed. And one of the things that I learned just from being around a couple of really brilliant scientists and inventors is uh, something I thought of, because uh, I, I don't remember very well unless I have a mnemonic, is mm-hmm. LSC. Listen to the suck with curiosity. Mm-hmm. The, either entrepreneurs or scientists or inventors, rather than dismiss or attack their challengers, they would probe why. They would set aside the emotion and the disappointment and really keep after them, help me understand, like a detective. Mm. What exactly, where exactly was the fail point for you? When exactly did you decide this wasn't working? And by teasing that out, they would collect enough data points to infer, oh, I had a blind spot. I didn't see this. And then they could go up to the next level on the staircase. And I I worked with a guy who absolutely deserved the Nobel Prize, a guy named Judah Folkman, who invented this idea of blocking uh, blood flow to tumors, now called angiogenesis, and behind many drugs that have helped tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients. And he had a lot of ups and downs in his career. In fact, one time, I think it was the Wall Street Journal published, you know, scientists failed to reproduce Folkman's results, which is, you know, when you get a headline in a major national newspaper, that your results are irreproducible. (laughs) That's kind of a career-ending move, (laughs) you know? So rather than get angry at the people who told the reporter this, you know, he called them up to try to figure out, help me understand exactly where your experiments are failing. And by doing that and probing, he came up with something really surprising, which is that when he was shipping the materials from his lab, when he was freezing them down and sending it cross country, the freezing process created a leakage between the plastic that contaminated the material. So it was no problem for people locally, but it was a problem just from the freezing process. So he changed how the materials would ship and then it started working again. And that's an example of LSE, listening to the suck with curiosity. You know, if you work really hard on something, if you have a beautiful a baby, you think it's beautiful. So it, mm-hmm. it's hard to hear when somebody says, I don't like your baby. And But it's even harder to say, help me understand why. In, in that particular example, of not being able to replicate those uh, results, you call a false fail if memory serves, correct? That's that's this idea that it just didn't work in that new environment doesn't mean it's not a permanent failure. That's right. So that's something that's, if you look at many great breakthroughs, they never worked the first time or very rarely worked the first time. They went through these multiple failures or multiple deaths. I call it the three deaths of the loon shot for Mm. some other stories I tell there. But I'll give you, a, you know, another example of a false fail. The way I think of a false fail is it's a failure in the experiment, a flaw in the design of the experiment, not in the underlying idea. So when Mark Zuckerberg was first shopping the idea of Facebook, of a social network, it was not the first social network or the second. It was about the 15th or 20th social mm-hmm. network, and none of them had taken off. And what happened with social networks, and right around the time he was shopping it around, there was uh, Friendster had been the social network du jour, the, the, the one that had grown really rapidly. And, I remember. And then was, was starting to decline, and people were leaving Friendster for some new one called MySpace. And so investors, most investors, had written off the whole idea of social networks for the, what seemed like an obvious reason. is like, well, these things are just like fads. 
because you see we had these other 10 networks and everybody started them for a while and then they hopped to the next one they hopped on Friendster and then they hopped on MySpace they're just like jeans you know you, you wear one one season then you wear a different one and most investors wrote it off that was obviously a false fail that was the false fail of Friendster if you want to alliterate and it was uh, Peter Thiel. There's a friend of mine who worked with Peter named Dick and Harry, who was uh, helping him with his private investments, who took a look at this and said, you know, I, we know some of the people working at Friends. Let, everybody seems to be saying that these are bad businesses, bad business models. They're like jeans. Let's probe that. Let's listen to that suck with some curiosity. Let's just take a look. So they got the data, asked Friendster for the data on user retention. And they knew that Friendster had a problem with their website. The website would start crashing. Once they went from a few thousand users to close to a million, the website had a bunch of glitches. And they, they knew that for personal experience. And they knew that Friendster had struggled and not been able to really solve that website glitch problem. So then they went and looked at the retention. They found, holy cow, people are staying on this site not for minutes, but for hours, mm. despite this hor you know, horrific <laughs> website problem. Like, why would they be doing that? Mm. Because it's a great business model. Because they get <laughs> like, wait a minute. Friendster is failing because they have a software glitch on their website, not because it's a bad business model. So he wrote, uh, he wrote a check for 500000 which he sold eight years later for a billion dollars. And that's an example of a false fail. It was a flaw in what people were looking at, but not a flaw in the underlying idea. Mm. Pretty pretty good return on investment, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it was not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, early in our discussion, I heard the word disruption uh, come up a time or two. Some might think that a loon shot is essentially the same thing. How is the concept of a loon shot, Safi, different from disruption or disruptive innovation? They're not the same, are they? No, in fact, that word gives me kind of gas pain just to hear the word <laughs> disruptive innovation. I, I'll tell you why, and I think experienced entrepreneurs – you know, often have a sort of a similar reaction, if, if even if they haven't quite articulated it. When you know some young guy comes in saying, you know, oh, I'm working on disrupting X or disrupting Y or this disrupt. The reality is that when you have an idea that's new and that's different and that challenges conventional wisdom, you have no idea where that is going to end up. It's sort of like a leaf in a tornado. And so people who have been through this kind of stuff know that predicting the future of an early stage idea is practically impossible. Mm -hmm. So the problem with disruptive innovation is that it's a statement about the future. My little idea is going to have this effect in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And as you know, one of my favorite quotes is, there are no experts of the future. There are only experts of the past. Mm -hmm. People have a hard enough time predicting what will happen next week, <laughs> certainly six months. The probability that you can estimate what your idea will effect it will have in the future, you know, 10 years from now is, is pretty ludicrous. So disruptive innovation is great for analyzing history, for looking backward. Did Walmart disrupt variety stores, you know, 30 or 40 years ago and all of them faded and disappeared and Walmart became this global giant? Yes. In history, in hindsight, that's exactly what happened. It was a disruptive. Now, when Sam Walton started that business, did he have any clue? No. He ended up moving to a small rural town because his wife didn't want to live in a city bigger than 10,000. And then he just started selling stuff a little bit cheaper. Was he trying to disrupt an industry? No. He had no idea. He didn't even know that there would be such demand. He was pretty worried that there would be big demand. But it was a leaf in a tornado, as he wrote later. We, we were staggered by the amount of demand mm -hmm. since everybody said, oh, well, if you want to have a retail store, you should be wherever the people are in cities. <laughs> so he ended up being in these far rural areas. And it turns out people would drive far. Lots of people would drive far to get to these big stores. So was he working on disruptive innovation? No. So looking forward, it sounds a little silly to say I'm working on disruptive innovation. If you are a history professor or a business school professor writing about changes in an industry looking backwards 30 years, then you could say yes. Da, 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 da. But if you are day-to-day -day an entrepreneur, especially if you're at a company or a leader or an executive, you can't predict the future. And it sounds kind of silly to try to predict the future. Not only is it silly, it's kind of misleading because if you only work on things that you're sure will disrupt an industry, you're going to miss the really important things that you had no idea. I'll give you an example. The transistor. Probably no invention disrupted human society in the 20th century more than the invention of the transistor. So when the first guys were working on surface states and the properties of semiconductor junctions, were they working on disruptive innovation? No. After they invented the point contact transistor in 1947, did they 
have any useful applications for it? Nope. No, they were they were trying to build better switches for the phone system, <laughs> and unfortunately, the transistor was useless for that. It was too expensive and too unreliable to use in the phone system, so they didn't know what to do with it. Eventually, somebody said, well, you know, we can't stick vacuum tubes inside hearing aids, but we might be able to stick these transistor things. You know, even though they're expensive, people will pay a lot of money for a hearing aid, mm. so let's try that. So five years later, they got transistors and hearing aids. So the first application was a hearing aid. So rewind, looking backwards, we can say the transistor may have been the most disruptive innovation of the 20th century. But if you're there and you're an executive at AT AT&T, Bell Labs, you're going to say, you know what, let's disrupt the hearing aid industry. Is that what they were saying in 1946? <laughs> no, they let's, let's work on disruptive innovation for the hearing aid. No, they were just trying to build better switches and figure out. So if you're an executive, the lesson for you is, if you want to study history, talk about disruptive innovation. But if you want to nurture, if you want to challenge your beliefs, because that's how you get killed in business. You have some embedded assumption that you think is absolutely certain, and then one day you read a press release, you open the newspaper, Open, sorry, open the newspapers 20 years ago. You click online, you read a headline about how your competitor has just come out with this product that makes you obsolete. That's because he was nurturing some idea that challenged your embedded assumption. So if you want to survive, the lesson is forget about disruptive. Not only is that misleading, it's going to hurt you because you will only work on the ideas that somehow you're sure will affect the market. But just like the transistor, had they been doing that, had they had leaders at at and only been working on stuff that they were sure that they might have never supported the research that led to the transistor. If you're a leader and you don't want to read that headline about how your competitor has just made you obsolete because he challenged and surprised you with an assumption that you knew was true, what you want to do is nurture those crazy ideas that challenge your accepted beliefs internally, not read about them in a headline a couple of years later. So if you're a leader, the lesson for you is the next time somebody comes to you and says, I have this, you know, kind of slightly crazy idea. And your gut reaction is this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I know for sure. I've been in the industry. I've been doing this 20 years. And I, I've been in that position. You know, by the time I was a CEO for 10, 11, 12 years, I felt like I had a pretty good sense of how things work. So when someone comes to you and says, I've got this sort of kind of crazy idea, and it sounds just idiotic, that might be a loon shot. Mm. So what you want to do is ask yourself, do I want to take the risk that my competitor works on this? And maybe I'm wrong. What happens if I'm wrong? What happened if this kid with this crazy idea is right and everything that I'm sure is true is wrong? Well, then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, somebody else will have been working on it and I'll be reading this headline about how I'm suddenly obsolete. So what you want to do is forget all these market estimates and disruptive and it's going to make a blah, blah, and it's going to transform the industry and blah, blah, blah. You want to have a group that just nurtures those crazy ideas that are the opposite of what you believe. They challenge your accepted wisdoms. Those are the loon shots and maybe most of them will fail and that's fine. You're investing them for the one that could be the bullet to your head two years from now. Mm. I think one of the best examples from the book of this idea of loon shot versus disruption that Safi gives is is IKEA. They're often looked at as having disrupted the the furniture industry, but but truth be told, furniture store owners retaliated by forbidding designers to work with them, for example. And I love the quote from IKEA's founder that you include, who knows whether we would have been as successful as we were if they'd offered us an honest fight. <laughs> and it's so true. That's right. I mean, if you're a business school professor and you write a case study, you say, oh, look, you know, Ikea disrupted the blah, blah, blah. They did, you know, these giant warehouse stores and they did uh, self-assembly and they cre- hired their own designers instead of, you know, farming it out. And all of these were great disruptive innovations. Well, that's great if you're a history professor writing a case study and teaching how it played out. Mm. But that's not what happened in real life. If, <laughs> if you were that, I actually can't pronounce his name. I don't know how to, <laughs> Ingvar, whatever. I, I, you know, I don't know this sweet. But if you were the IKEA okay, founder, that's, he was just a young guy with a mailing list selling you know, pens and pencils you know, and, and Christmas cards mm. off a mailing list. And he said, oh, I think I want to add some, you know, maybe some furniture. And uh, the major furniture retailers in Switzerland said, well, that's a terrible idea. So they made life, they said, you can't exhibit. He wanted to exhibit and show him. So he said, yeah, you know what? We're blocking you. Mm. You can't exhibit. So he had to go build his own showroom. And then they cut off suppliers. And so they said, you know what? You can't work with this young guy if you want to work with us. And so the suppliers in Sweden all cut him off. So he said, oh, he got on a plane and he went to Poland and he found suppliers there who did just as good 
work for half the price. And he <laughs> was able to lower his price because of that. Again, was he trying to create a disruptive innovation by you know, getting suppliers in Poland to do it? No, he was just trying to survive. Was he building a showroom because he was thinking, I have this disruptive idea, I'm going to create... No, he was just locked out mm. because these guys are trying to play unfair. And so he was just trying to survive. And when he opened his first warehouse just outside Stockholm, you know, because he had these good low prices, he was kind of mobbed. So the guys at the front desk said, you know, just go back there and like pick out whatever you want and bring it up front. And all of a sudden that worked great. (laughs) So was he trying to disrupt people with his whole, you know, you shop for yourself and you bring the price? No, he was like, he was just trying to survive. So again, disruptive innovation is good for hindsight. But if you are today running a business or managing your group, forget all about these analyses and studies about what the effect of your product will be on the market and just nurture, figure out what are your embedded assumptions? What do you really Mm. believe is absolutely true? And then who's pursuing the opposite of that? Mm. Beware of shooting yourself in your foot. (laughs) That's right. Um, I got a couple of questions, Safi, not directly related to the book before I get to those. um, Is there anything else from the book you want to make sure we walk away with? No, I, you know, I mean, there's obviously a lot of story. We did, you know, there's stories about the birth of modern science and why was it Western Europe rather than China, Islam, and India, and that that was really fun for me, just because yeah. I have a, a bug for history, and in fact, that's sort of how I started on this project. But I think we've we've touched on a mm. a nice selection, so. Well, I'm glad you brought up that last part because uh, the way you ended the book, I thought, was just the icing on the cake. And so we'll, we'll leave that for folks who, who want to dive into the book and purchase the book and, and enjoy that for, for future reading. So thank you. I want to ask you about the books you've read over the course of your career, and I know that may be a lot. If you could uh, pick your favorites, those books that have had a particular impact on you, maybe two or three, and, and why they impacted you as, as they did. You know, I, I th- if I think back just in the last year or two, I, you know, I don't know how relevant this will be for on the business side, but on the writing side, if you want to write, there were, there were two books that really stood out for me. If you want to write in a way that engages a broader audience, and I, you know, I came from academic world, so I, there's this kind of horrible academic writing style, and if you're in the business world, there's probably an equal, <laughs> there's almost certainly an equally horrible <laughs> business writing style that's that's kind of horrific to read. But I, I probably spent two or three years just unlearning, unlearning mm-hmm. all the bad habits from uh, writing and either an academic style or a business style. That I'd say probably the two books that were most helpful for me, and part of that is just training your ear to hear and recognize the rhythm and cadence of words. For me, the first one was uh, Nabokov's uh, short story collection. Mm. And I, I didn't really read, to, to train the ear, I actually didn't read full novels or full stories or full nonfiction books. I would read short passages. And I would just, you know, at eight o'clock after dinner was done and kids were in bed, and, you know, wife was otherwise occupied, I would just take two or three paragraphs of some beautiful passage that I'd stumbled across and just try to break it down. Why did this guy use this word here and not there in the sentence? Hmm. Why did he use passive voice when everyone says you should use active voice? Why did he choose this particular word, not that particular word, when that other word is it seems more obvious? And what happens if you do it differently? Well, it just sounds worse. Why? So I would spend probably two hours a night just trying to deconstruct two paragraphs. <laughs> and you know, my, a lot of that time was just from that book of short stories. So that, that one was very influential. If you want, I remember when I first opened page somewhere in the middle a friend of mine had given me the book and i i, I know zero about literature because i you know it's sort of a science geek so i really didn't <laughs> <laughs> like my history or literature friends i really had, had like a giant black hole for you know reading anything good but uh, <laughs> you know aside from like lacare thrillers or when i opened that i just like my jaw dropped to the floor i couldn't believe that the <laughs> english language could do that i'd never <laughs> seen the english language do that before and i was like holy cow the other thing you don't learn if you have a uh, academic or business background or writing style is how to hit emotion, how to hit characters, how to portray people and words in ways that resonate. And uh, for that, a friend of mine had given me another gift, uh, which was um, Donald Hall's essay collection. So I, I actually didn't know who this is, but he was a a poet laureate. So he really understands and chooses his words and obsesses about them carefully. But unlike Nabokov, he has this 
deep emotional core and he deeply cares about people and it comes across in ways that are fresh and interesting and not at all cheesy and incredibly powerfully affecting mm-hmm. you know he talks about his his uh, wife and his, the love of his life uh, developing cancer at a young age it's just really hard to read that without being just incredibly powerfully moved mm-hmm. you know and the book of was just playing he didn't seem to care very much about any of his characters <laughs> Hall wrote with just incredibly deep, interesting, powerful emotion. So I, I would recommend, you know, if you're a business person and you want to open your mind a little bit to some beautiful writing and, you know, just read Donald Hall's uh, Essays After 80. It was fantastic. Well, I want to end, Safi, by asking uh, what's ahead for you? Besides promoting the book, what's ahead for you and your team that you're currently excited about? Uh, well, I have two projects. One is uh, maybe a little more technical. You know, this book is about the idea that organizations will have these phase transitions, these phase changes, and why they will. Hmm. That anytime you bring a group of people together, you create the conditions for a phase change, just like Hmm. you do when you bring molecules together in a glass of water. So it's a different way to view organizations. And as part of writing this, I was trying to give some examples of phase changes or phase transitions. You know, I gave the example of fires spreading in forests. You know, they go from contained to wildfires. I gave an example of traffic on highways going from smooth flow to jam flow. That's a phase transition. And then I thought when I was writing, I thought, you know, there's another obvious one, which should be pretty easy, which is a markets, financial markets. Mm. They go from a rational phase to a bubble phase. So that should be easy. Uh, Well, it turns out that wasn't that easy. (laughs) You know, I was going to, I went to start looking through the literature, you know, so that I could, you know, use two paragraphs, sort of like some funny short example that everybody would know, because everybody knows that markets have bubbles and crashes. Mm. Everybody knows that. Yet, as it turns out, and I also had not studied much economics, it turns out that economists don't know that. <laughs> so, in fact, all the Nobel Prizes that have been given for you know the behavior of financial markets, going back to Arrow and to Bro and the general theory of equilibrium and efficient markets, many, many prizes, there's no bubbles and crashes in those theories. Mm. E- efficient markets don't have bubbles and crashes. So it's like, that seems a little weird, because if there's one thing the guy in the street knows is that markets have crashes, how do you get all these Nobel Prizes for theories where there's no bubbles and crashes? That seems a little off to me. Doesn't that seem a little strange? So, uh, but then as I got a little deeper into the world of economics, I realized economics is full of stuff like that, <laughs> stuff that the average person knows, but economists who <laughs> win Nobel Prizes don't seem to know. Mm. So I just thought that was kind of a fascinating problem, so... I spent a while, I kind of put the book aside, and then I did a similar kind of model that shows why markets will always have bubbles and crashes. So that's kind of a project I really want to, you know, once this book stuff is done, that's my next project. Yeah, wasn't there this idea, I think Greenspan used this phrase several years ago, the idea of the, the invisible hand and how the, the definition, uh, the original definition of that got misconstrued over the years. And, and, and again, that, that doesn't really apply to markets, as, as you said. Am, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's right. That's part of this whole markets are very efficient. There's this invisible hand. And that comes from a failure to understand phase transitions. Mm. Efficient markets are one phase. And so when Greenspan was, you know, saying after the the crisis, after the financial crisis, he says, well, you know, with notably rare exceptions, markets are well behaved and efficient. (laughs) You know, that I remember there was some other economists saying, well, that's sort of like saying Germany has been at peace with its neighbors in the 20th century, with notably rare exceptions. Mm, mm. Actually, you're kind of interested. That's exactly what you care. You <laughs> care about the. It's like a weather forecaster saying, you know, well, it's it's sunny. Uh, you know, the, the rest of this month is going to be sunny with, you know, notably rare ex- exceptions. It's like only understanding good weather with understanding. And what you really want to understand are those storms and those droughts and those mm. exceptions. You know, you want, if you go outside, you want to know, are you going to need an umbrella? So, yeah, this different way of thinking, it's this kind of, it's called the science of emergence, gives you a handle on that. It gives you a fresh way of thinking about that. And I think, you know, part of what's interesting for me is that if you look back in history, 20th century science was all about trying to understand the very, very small or the very, very large. Mm. What's inside an atom? What's inside a proton? What's inside a neutron? What are the quarks and gluons doing? So that's the very small or the very large, the trillions and trillions of galaxies in our universe and what's the dark matter between them and what's the dark energy that's making the universe expand. But it's that glass of water that in between, the science of emergence. Why do groups act in these mysterious ways that I think is what the 
21st century science is going to be about. It helps us under, it can help us understand, for example, the behavior of the brain. You can study an individual neuron, but what do groups of neurons mm. do? And you can use that to tease out disease states between epilepsy and normal brains and so on. So that's kind of what's exciting for me is applying mm. these ideas more broadly. And tracking terrorist cells and that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, that's right. That was another application, <laughs> using that to track terrorists online. Yeah. Well, a fascinating book begets a fascinating conversation. Somehow I'm not surprised. His name is Safi Bakal, and the book again is called Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. Safi, thank you so much for giving so generously of your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Been fun. Well, if you're like me and you feel smarter now just hearing Safi speak, wait till you dig into the book. I absolutely loved it, and I think you will too. To get it, to dig more into what Safi and I talked about, including some of the links and resources discussed, you can visit the show notes page for this episode. It's a blog post dedicated to today's episode. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash 259 for episode 259. You'll also find out more information there about our sponsor. That's Self Publishing School, giving away that free book called Published from Chandler Bolt when you sign up for the free Self Publishing School training. The special URL for that, if you want to go right there right now, is readtoleadpodcast.com slash published. And remember, too, that I would love to have you in the audience for my first ever conference, an online conference happening beginning April 30th through May 7th, 2019. And it's free to attend and you can attend from anywhere on any device. It includes 30 plus speakers all talking about being your own boss, starting your own business and doing your own thing. If you've ever thought about those things or would just like to explore the idea, you can do so with discretion at BossFreeSummit.com. Again, registration is free. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Редактор субтитров А.Семкин Корректор А.Егорова